Well, it's really steep, Gene. I guess uh, they don't think of it as being so steep. It, it's that old energy management. They can, they can, they convert their altitude and airspeed uh, so that they end up at the right place at the right time. It's a, it's a phenomenal thing to be able to do, and yet we've done it so many times that uh, we again begin here to take it for granted, unfortunately. It is absolutely a spectacular day to watch Challenger come home. I could imagine it's a bit hazy here, but no clouds, almost no clouds from the ground. And as soon as it uh, gets in the vicinity, you watch people are going to be jumping up and down. After. Servicing convoy at Edwards, ready to roll. Range now 110 nautical miles, altitude 107,000 feet. I can expect it'll take about four minutes for them to get from that 110 Velocity miles to a point overhead. To 4,000 feet per second. And Gene, they will be doing that big circle over the airfield, which slows them down and brings them into the right alignment. Is that Best right? way to describe it, Lynn, is a teardrop. They'll come overhead and do a big, wide, wide turn, and uh, that's to keep them within range of the field in case something should happen. Gust of wind, they still have, they're still close enough to get down quickly. And again, they will be landing on the concrete strip at Edwards. That's exactly where the last flight of Columbia landed. Uh, that because the, uh, the, the dry lake bed isn't quite so dry. It's just a little too soggy, a little too deep for them to land there. You know, they wanted to bring uh, Challenger in for the first time on the dry lake bed since it is the maiden landing. Uh, I guess there's really no concern, though, about landing on the concrete strip. Challenger Houston, take your data to GNC only. We can see here that what they are predicting is uh, several thousands of people that came out this Saturday afternoon. They've been camping here, I understand. 1,000 feet altitude. 2,000 feet per second, 72 nautical miles range. That, that's still 2,000 miles per hour, and they're only 72 miles away from Edwards here. Again, uh, we can expect them overhead uh, in about a uh, minute and a half, or excuse me, about two and a half minutes. And uh, Lynn, we can look forward to that big sonic boom. There's a, there's a view from one of the chase planes. That's the pilot of the chase plane going after Columbia, uh, going after Challenger, excuse me, to bring it in. Obviously, the camera on the back of the plane. Now, remember, the chase planes can only get up to about 40 or 45,000 feet, and the Challenger is still going to, when it passes overhead, is going to be well over 50,000 feet. Uh, there are fewer chase planes flying than there have been in the past, Gene. I believe there's only one up today. There have been too many at four before. 2,100 feet per second, 52 nautical miles. 52 nautical miles, and they're still about 1,400 miles per hour in their traveling speed, so they're going to slow down pretty quickly. The sonic boom should uh, occur, Lynn. I expect them overhead uh, just in another minute and a half, and we're going to get that double boom. I, I'm actually looking for the contrails now. I, uh, I think everybody's got their eyes peered westward, hoping to see the uh, glimpse of the Challenger reflected in the sunlight. There is a small white uh, spot in the middle of your monitor, and that should be Challenger. If you look very closely, this is a NASA tracking camera that has picked it up already. You know, it's always exciting to get that first glimpse. Uh, outer space is still a little bit mysterious to most of us. That camera is located in Northern California. Uh, it's a long-range camera. We ought to be able to see the contrails uh, uh, of the chase plane pretty soon now. That's our first real identification to be able to uh, then from there see the, the Challenger itself. There it is. Range 30 nautical miles, 60,000 feet altitude. Velocity 1,250 uh, feet per second. One of the reasons I, we can now see the Challenger uh, on that camera, of course, one of the reasons for this, uh, uh, this long-range video is to document uh, this part of the entry that we can see from the ground. It's significantly important to the, uh, to the control and the, and the further use of the Challenger. Well, people have started there we pointing. Have the we chase now, plane. There it is. There's the contrails of the chase plane right overhead us. We can see it. Uh, it's not quite on we your have, screen. There is Challenger. We There's ought to get that sonic view. boom. And it can be seen with the naked eye from Edwards Air Force Base. We might remind you that the shuttle is returning as a glider. It has no engine power to help it out. Sonic Buffett, we've been waiting for it. Roger, copy that. You're right on your energy. This flight well, is everything going looks good here, right? Could look better. This looks the same down here, PJ. Velocity down less than a thousand feet per second. There she Mission control in Houston. Challenger Houston bow. 
Request manual open on landing gear ISO valve number two. Right on cue. Hello, how are you today, Charlie? Thank you, sir. The sonic boom got a big cheer here. This flight has been right down the pike in uh, aviators talk uh, since it began, and uh, this Arnold Peterson. He's in his left-hand turn now, Mort, coming around and heading alignment circle. He'll play it a little bit closer to the runway because of these wind conditions. He's moved his aim point in about 1,000 feet closer to the runway to compensate for the a little stronger wind than normal. Getting a good picture now from the rear seat camera. And these are taken from the chase plane, T-38. 25,000 feet altitude. The shuttle will be landing at 224 and a half miles per hour, almost twice as fast as most commercial uh, manual, jetliners uh, do. Pitch and roll mode. Totally controlling aircraft uh, uh, manually uh, and flying it where he wants it to go. We're getting a perfect shot of it from here, and the, the visual shot, the people here are ecstatic. Sir, probably a lot of sailboats out there today. They were commenting here about all the water that Paul White can see that's uh, surrounding the runway. We got the camera on. Gene, you were mentioned earlier, it's uh, like landing on a, eight, on a carrier. Two two zero, right down the runway at 18 knots. Okay, verify you still have the close aim point. That's a firm. Mm -hmm. Fourteen thousand feet altitude. What a pretty picture she is. You know, this this time they've painted Challenger's name uh, on the uh, rear Still of the plane, so they can identify it from here. Not confuse it with Columbia. Seven miles to touchdown. And in Paul Weitz is still flying it uh, manually at this point in time. He's got an option of going in the automatic mode if he's so desired, but uh, he is still 10, holding on to it manually. 10,000 feet above the lake bed. There's, look at that wonderful shot, right from in front. Coming right down at him. That is a 189,904 pound lighter. An artillery shell with wings. Now you can see the 19 degree glide slope with the horizon in the background. You get a good idea of the attitude of the airplane. About 45 seconds from touchdown. Okay, I'll round out of this 19 degree glide slope onto a one and a half and at four. About uh, 300 miles an hour yet. Uh, is, here comes the landing gear in plenty of time. Absolutely parallel with the ground. He's headed it right into the wind. Keep it coming on down, Paul. It's about ready for touchdown. Look for the dust. What a sight. Touchdown, and what a roar from the crowd, Lynn. Perfect landing. There it goes. Challenger is back home. And what a sight. The unofficial touchdown time at uh, 5 days, 0 hours, 23 minutes, 42 seconds. I think they were a few seconds off, but, I, but uh, <laughs> we'll accept that at this point. Of course, they took off eight hundredths of a second late, I believe, too, so it you doesn't know, all really All that matter. weight in fixing the engines uh, sure pays off in the end, doesn't it? Now we have to wait to see how long it will be before they come out of the spacecraft, now that they've actually uh, brought it home, got it down safely. Unfortunately, I think they'd like to, uh, to get out quickly and uh, kick the tire and, uh, and sort of exuberate. We'll stop that. Two the, uh, minute. The, the final test uh, that was conducted here was a braking test. Uh, we couldn't see it too well from here, but uh, Paul Weitz was to apply maximum braking for a short period of time to see the response of the braking system because, you know, next time uh, we hope we see Challenger come back to uh, the Kennedy Space Center. On a much shorter runway with alligators in the water. Here's a replay of the landing. Servicing procedures and safety. This is a head-on view just before uh, it touched down right after the wheels came out. And another orbiter joins the fleet of active spacecraft in the STS system. 
Challenger well, is no longer a rookie. Absolutely, and there is the proud announcement from NASA. Another orbiter joins the fleet. This, of course, is what NASA's been waiting for, the chance to say that it really does have at least the beginnings of a fleet. Two orbiters now, a third on its way uh, out of the assembly line. About a year from now, we should be seeing Discovery. And another view. These are all so pretty, we could just we'll, keep on looking at them. We'll see the gear come down. There's the gear. Gear comes down, and they put that gear down manually when they decide to do it. And again, it's at a point okay, in the energy the curve that they do this. What you're listening to is the live, uh, I was going to say air to ground, but it's ground to ground now. It's the pilot and mission control talking to one another. Uh, you're, you're, Although this is a replay. You're right on it, Lynn. Ground to ground. They are back home. Day five, zero hours, 24 minutes, 32 seconds. Yeah, that's no problem. You can press on. And we do have a fleet of operational shuttle.